to alert everyone uh, in case it comes up in the next few witnesses, not the next few witnesses, but a witness after Mr. Jenkins, uh, the state may be in a position to argue uh, six, um, I don't know, 613 and 803.26. Run. Yes, sir. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Please give us your name, sir. Xavier Jenkins. Spell your first name, please. X A V I E R. Well, I'm from Shelby, North Carolina, uh, but I've been here my whole life, Knoxville, Tennessee. Sir, so breaking your attention back to uh, January 2007, uh, were you working here in Knox County? I was. Where were you working at? Waste Connections. And uh, if you want to, we can pull that microphone down a little bit closer. What did you do for Waste Connections? I was a driver. Now, uh, was there a, a new position that you were uh, trained for? It was. Can you tell us about that, please? Okay, so I was a residential driver um, and basically approached by uh, a couple of guys for a uh, commercial driving position, uh, front end loader. I don't know if you all know the containers or whatnot for commercial businesses. So I was training for that position. Now, uh, was there any type of uh, training that you had to go through in order to train for that position? Uh, just a little practice over the weekends, uh, you know, in your spare time after work and uh, of course being with an actual trainer uh, going out and running a couple of routes uh, with the trainer. And what time were those routes? Usually 1230 to about 7 depending on when the trainer got there. And uh, where Waste Connections, where is that located? Uh, Chipman Street. It's actually I believe on Mitchell or I think the address for them is Chipman though if I'm not mistaken. Sir, if I can direct your attention to January 6th going into January 7th. 2007, show you a calendar to let you know what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, late night, Saturday, early morning hours on uh, the 7th, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Do you recall uh, that morning? I do. And if you could tell the court where you were at and what you were doing that morning. Um, again, I applied for uh, the new position, uh, so I was in training, 
And I was instructed by my supervisor to be there at 1230 and that one of the lead drivers uh, would train me. So I was parked there behind the building uh, waiting for the uh, trainer to get there. And when you say you're parked behind the building, what street were you parked on? I believe it's Chipman, but I can probably show you better than I can tell you. If I can direct your attention, for the record, I need to call this number out. To 427, do you recognize exhibit 427? Yes. And what do you recognize exhibit 427 to be? Uh, the area uh, of the business in the house. If you could, using that red marker, can you use mark an X as to where you were parked? Sure. It's okay for him to step down your own? Yes, sir. And uh, your vehicle, uh, what type of vehicle was it that you were driving? Uh, Dodge Dynasty, I believe, back there in the room. And in which direction was it pointing? I was parked here. Phone call, I'd say probably about 12.30. It may have been 12.35, possibly, but it was definitely on time somewhere. What did you think that you noticed? Uh, when I got there, initially, um, just that the house, uh, it was <coughs> usually dark in that area, the house was kind of busy, uh, porch light on, uh, a few vehicles parked out front, uh, parking lights, things of that sort on, uh, the forerunner that was involved. Now, had you been to that? You've been to that location before at that time. Yeah. And had you had this? Had you noticed this before? No. Now you say uh, the porch light was on. Yes. For what house? Um, the I guess it would be considered Chitman Street House. I don't know the address. And you said something about a forerunner. Correct. Where was the forerunner located? Uh, directly in front of the house. What did you notice about the uh, Just the headlights or parking lights seem to be on. Uh, it just, like I said, the area seemed busy. It seemed like there was a lot of traffic, you know, in or out. Did you notice any other vehicles? I did. What vehicles did you notice? Uh, there was a white vehicle behind it. Um, and there was uh, maybe one or two vehicles behind that, but I believe those to be the uh, neighbor's vehicles because they were, you know, more than like a car space further back. I do. What do you recognize exhibit five to be? That's the uh, forerunner, Toyota forerunner. Talking about the six. Uh, you recognize exhibit fourteen? I do. And what is exhibit fourteen? That's the car parked directly behind the forerunner. Now, if you could, sir, on uh, that map, exhibit four twenty-seven, can you write uh, forerunner where you saw uh, the forerunner and uh, WC? I was sitting there and of course I guess 30 45 minutes maybe had went by so I uh, started wondering you know where's my trainer um, so I went around to the store uh, well there's a phone actually at the Weigel's there pay phone I went to call him and see what was going on with him uh, and after I got off the phone with him went directly across the street to get uh, M&M's and uh, soda Uh, back, back to the uh, parking lot to wait on him. What did you know? And when you get back to the parking lot, where are you parked at? 
Yeah, same spot. And Brett, how do you acquire positions? Same way, face of the business. Uh, as I'm sitting there, uh, the forerunner with the lights on, uh, then drives off, and they drive in my direction, which, you know, it's nothing odd about that, uh, but they drove in my direction, and as they got right there in the bend, they slowed down, kind of, uh, you know, check me out or whatnot, see if I could see them or see, you know, who I was, I guess. Uh, they then went all the way around to the front of the building and at that time I'm already kind of on alert because they slowed down and look at me. You know, it's dark back there. Uh, there's not a whole lot of lighting, but there's lighting toward the business. So, you know, parked in, in that area, there's a lot of grassiness and overgrown weeds and things that sort of directly behind you. So it kind of puts you on edge. But they went to the stop sign on the right and went in front of the building, which struck me as kind of odd because again, if they were gonna, I guess, go, I don't know which direction that would be, they would go away from the business. They could have easily just did a U-turn uh, in front of the house. They could have done a U-turn right in front of me. I mean, if they had nothing to you know, worry about, they would have done a U-turn right in front of me, just kind of threw up a hand, waved at me, and went on. Speculating as to what was in the minds of the people to be as strange to these it did, so much so that I called my father and told him, hey, uh, some guys just looked at me, and he said, just watch, well, he said, watch your eight, <laughs> you know, because he knew where I was. Now, were you able to determine uh, any of the people in the vehicle? I couldn't see any faces, uh, so I couldn't tell you who was in the vehicle, but I could okay. definitely tell how many. It was four people in the vehicle. Uh, the driver, to me, uh, was seemed to be the tallest. Uh, he had on a bomber coat with a fur collar, if you will, almost like your bubble jacket, I guess, kind of deal. Because uh, you could see in that silhouette, I could see the fur around the collar. Um, and the passenger, the far back passenger on the right side, he was slumped down in the in the seat like he was trying to hide. I don't know if that, I don't know why that is, but yeah. So how many people total did you see in the vehicle? Total of four. Can you tell us what sex they were? To me, they were all men, and from the demeanor, I thought they were black men. Just because of the, the behavior, the way they were driving, uh, you know, I, I grew up in East Knoxville. So, you know, we don't, we don't drive straight up holding, holding the steering wheel with two hands, you know, we're gonna lean and look out the window, whatever, and that's what, you know, the driver was doing. So going back to Exhibit 427, can you draw first the path that the forerunner took with the red mark? Pulled out from here, in this direction here, slowed here in the corner, Yeah. What happened after that? Uh, let's see here. Basically, uh, called him. He said, of course, watch back. And I guess 30 minutes maybe, uh, Leroy pulls in, who was my trainer. Uh, he pulls in, opens the gate, uh, lets, you know, lets both me and him in. We park our vehicles inside so that, you know, people can't mess with your cars and things of that sort while you're at work. Uh, pull in, park our vehicles, go upstairs, wait for uh, my other boss, uh, operations manager, wait for his son to show up, he was training with us. 
uh, and then we all clock in and go to work. Um, come back, I guess, 6.30ish, 6 6.40ish, 6 somewhere in there. Uh, and as we're pulling in, I notice the forerunner. Um, and it's parked where I was parked, but further a little bit back toward the railroad tracks and, and facing the railroad track. So I told Leroy, I said, hey man, I said, something odd about that. I said, I believe it's a stolen vehicle. He said, nah man, it's probably some teenagers, some back here, they be back here all the time making out, blah, blah, blah. So Leroy decided, he said, well, he said, hold on. He put on the bright lights. And I don't know if you all have seen some of these trash trucks, but they're flat nose. It's what we call a cab over. Uh, so we were able to pull like inches away from the glass, thinking that that would shine somewhat through the glass because it had tinted windows. Um, but when you were that close and with that tint, it actually reflected the light of the headlights back at you so we couldn't tell so we backed up he said no nah, there's nobody in there but i said well hold on pull to the back of it so he backs up he pulls to the rear of it and uh i wanted to make sure you know see if it was out of place i mean we're in you know we're in knox so if it had uh you know a strange tag or knox or say like a granger county or hamilton county something different then i know it's out of place but uh it had a knox county tag and uh he said, man, it's just probably nothing, you know. And we basically blew it off and pulled in and uh, clocked out and went home. Directing your attention to Exhibit 6, you recognize Exhibit 6? I do. What do you recognize Exhibit 6 to be? Uh, the forerunner. Now, does this look uh, the same as it looked that night or that morning? No, ma'am. What's the difference? Uh, it looks like it's missing the uh, T that was in the uh, position in the window. For the record, we would like to look at evidence in exhibit 14. Any objection? No objection. Let it be received. Now, sir, in uh, preparation for testimony, did you meet with the federal authorities and did they show you a photo lineup involving the white people? They did. If I can approach and show you exhibit 418, And now tell us what anyone said, but can you tell us the circumstances, uh, maybe where you were at when you were shown? You recognize Exhibit 418? Yeah. And what do you recognize Exhibit 418 to be? Uh, the car lineup. And uh, do you recall where you were at whenever you were shown this car lineup? Yes, man, I was on my route. And. Uh, my trash route. Your trash route. Yeah. And so showing you Exhibit 418, what were you asked to do on Collective 418? Um, he basically contacted my supervisor, found out where I was, met with me. Uh, we pulled off to the side of the road, and he basically asked me if there were any other cars there. And I said, yeah, there were. He said, is there anything that you could you know, possibly remember about those cars? Uh, maybe like color, you know, how old they were, blah, blah, blah. And, and as he said that, I said, well, yeah, it was, it was white. You know, and I said probably about late 90s or early 90s, I'm sorry, uh, late 80s. And he said, well, uh, is there anything else you can remember? I said, well, yes, it had a red pinstripe. And he said, if I showed you a lineup of these cars, could you possibly identify? I said, it's possible, you know. He said, well, hold on. And he laid them out on the car. I remember he had three on top, three on the bottom, on the hood of the car. And he did them really kind of one by one. So he went one. I said, no, nah, it doesn't jar anything. He went two, three, four, five. And when he got to the one with the pinstripe, I said, yeah, that one there. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, sir. And he said, would you be willing to sign the back of these? And as I signed, he said, okay, on this one, the ones that you said weren't uh, the car, could you please, you know, initial and put the word no? And I did. And then he said, on the one that you initial or said it is the car, could you put yes? And I did that. And um, so what are we looking at in a collective exhibit 418? Uh, just looks like the car lineup pictures. And on, the, six. on the first page, 
the, or your initials on the back of it. And on the first page, put, uh, tell us about your initials. What's underneath your initials? Uh, it has a date 10 207 3 25 p.m. in my writing and the word no. All right. What about the second page? My initials 10 207 3 25 p.m. Yes. My, my writing. In that second page, why did you write yes on the second page? That was the one that I identified that was behind the four All right. What about the third page? My initials, 10, 12, 7, 3, 25 p.m. No in my handwriting. Again, 3, 25 p.m. No in my handwriting. That's the fourth page. Yes, ma'am. Fifth page, 10, 12, 7, 3, 25 p.m. No in my handwriting. 10, 12, 7, 3, 25 p.m. No in my handwriting. On the sixth page. That could be a uh, collective exhibit. And this is the one here that you wrote yes on? Yes. And that's the same car as that pictured up there? Yes. We would like to move into evidence exhibit 418 and publish it to the jury. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Let it be received and published. Yeah, um, I was sitting there, and when they slowed, um, when I was first initially asked about, you know, uh, what happened, that was the word that I used to describe how they looked at me. I, they came through, and I basically told them, yeah, they mean mugged me, and I kind of mean mugged them back, you know, to say, you know, they were looking at me as if, like, you know, why are you here? And I gave them a look like, why are you here? I work here. Um, I guess it was just a male thing, you know, I don't know, you know, when, I, it's hard to explain if anybody's been in that situation when two, you know, when men are looking at each other, it's kind of like, you know, you don't back down and that's what I felt was going on. Now, the vehicle that you saw, let's first talk about the, uh, the Forerunner. It had tinted windows, correct? Forerunner, yes. Okay. And what first, I think you described it pretty well, but I think pr this is what, the eighth time you've testified in some proceedings? It's been some years, I'm not sure. Yeah, this is the 12th year. Multiple times that you've had to correct. testify, been under cross-examination by various attorneys. Correct in these proceedings. Um, this area, obviously, you have the uh, garbage company that's right there, and, and there's where they park the garbage trucks, correct? Correct. And you said when you're on shift, you park the car in that facility, in the, within the gates of the facility? Yes. Because you don't want anybody to come mess with your car, break correct. into it, or anything like that. The area where you parked and where you put the X on, that area is undeveloped. It's basically a vacant lot, correct? Um, it's not vacant. It used to actually be in a parking lot for scales. Okay. Um, I don't know what they used them for, but they're kind of like a, a abandoned scale, a truck scale. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. The guys may be, but it's a truck scale back there, and we've no longer used it. So grass and weed and things grass like that. Grass and weed. It's grown up. There's no houses or anything like that. No. And so uh, in, in that area is obviously dark at night time, this Correct. time of day. Correct. So that area is dark. I think you've testified that generally speaking on Chipman Street, because you've got these residences that are right there, that area is usually d uh, dark as well. Correct? Correct. And that what first attracted you to Chipman Street to the house was the fact that they had the porch light on and then they had a car. And I think that it had its um, running lights on the car. Uh, yeah, running lights. Yeah. Running lights on, but not the headlights. Uh, that I can remember, yes. And I know you said that the Waste Connections is really well illuminated, correct? Yes. All right. But further on down the street, I mean, there are some street lights, but there are areas that are, it's fairly dark back there. Uh, 
I would say, yeah. Yeah. And I believe you've also previously testified that it's about 300 feet between where your car was parked and where the, the, the white car that you saw. About a football length. If I had to guess, I would say probably maybe this courtroom and a half or more, Sergeant. Do you recall having testified to it being 300 feet previously? I'm not sure. Would it help to refresh your recollection if I showed you the previous testimony? It's, if it's there, that's fine. So you're not, you're not saying, you're not contesting that you didn't say that it was 300 feet? No. All I'm saying is I was parked in the gravel parking lot. Sure. Caddy corner, and gotcha. I could see the house. Mm -hmm. The house was busy. The house had a light on. The forerunner had a light on the front of it. There was a white vehicle with a red pinstripe parked directly behind it. There was other cars parked behind that. Yes, I understand. This is at 12:30 to 1:30 at night, correct? Correct. You were there for about an hour, at least. Give or take. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think we actually have where you clocked in. It was closer to 2 o'clock, if I Correct. remember correctly. So and you were sitting there, and at least some of that time you had left to, uh, I think you made a phone call to your supervisor, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, lead driver, yeah. Roy. Mm -hmm. And so you went to the Weigels, which at that time of day is closed, right? Correct. And then you went and bought your candy bar and your soda, soda over at the uh, Marathon no, across correct. the street. All right. So you're sitting there. And you said this forerunner comes driving by you and slows down. Mm -hmm. And what you saw were the silhouettes of heads in the vehicle, correct? Correct. Through the tinted window. Correct. So you weren't, and you've never been, you've never testified that you were actually able to make out the features as far as the no. facial features of any of the people no. in the vehicle. Do you remember anything in particular about any hairstyles or anything like no. that? Um, no, I couldn't. Um, I would say that they probably didn't have long hair, because I probably would have saw that, uh, considering I could have seen, I could actually see the fur on the bomber jacket. So if they had, say, like you know, this lady here hair, I would probably be able to see that. You, you would but, probably be able to see, but you don't recall. No, no, you don't recall. So when you're saying that this was four men, this is based on your perception of these four, the silhouettes in the car. Um, and and the attitude, the general attitude of the silhouettes. Attitude and posture. Slumping More so posture. Yeah, well, not the slumping down. Um, That's it slowing the car down as they're passing. Yeah. yeah. And again, you can't make out any of the features of the people. No. What prompted you to actually contact, you said some, uh, something to your supervisor, correct, about having seen the forerunner, right? Um, well, what happened uh, as the days go on, uh, you know, every morning for a regular shift, we meet up in the uh, break room, if you will, and we've got TVs. So they started flashing pictures of the forerunner, trying to get information. And when they flashed it, I looked at Leroy and I said, you know, like, dude, that's the truck. And I said it in front of the entire, you know, people that were working that morning. They were like, you know, what is he talking about? I was like, Leroy, that's the truck. And he was like, nah, I was like, no, dude, that's the truck, the one that we pulled up on, that's it. And I think from that, uh, when things started getting heated up, ATF agents, things of that sort, sort started showing up, uh, the word had been, okay, you might want to talk to one of our guys because he, you know, he's seen something and he's told one of the people in the break room that he, he thought that was the truck. So they interviewed him. Yeah, so you didn't contact law enforcement. What it was, it was actually the media coverage of this case that got you to say, hey, hold on, I've seen that forerunner. Correct. Okay, and then based on that, about a week later, a uh, detective came out and talked to you about the forerunner. Um, I'm not even sure if it was a week later. It could have been within the next day or two because they were moving, you know, pretty fast, I'm sure, trying to get that, you know, information. But it was a couple of days later that they Probably. came out and they talked to you yeah. about the specifics uh, about seeing the forerunner. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, you didn't say anything to them about seeing the white car there? No. I did tell him there were other cars, uh, but he didn't, he didn't ask about the other cars. His but you, you, again, my question was, you didn't, you didn't tell him about the white car being there? 
No, but I did tell him about other cars. I specifically told him about what I saw, just like I told you all. There was, was a forerunner, other cars parked behind, and he focused in on the forerunner. He said, okay, tell me more about the forerunner. And it was actually when preparations were being made for Mr. Boyd's trial in federal court that you were contacted by the uh, attorneys preparing for the case, correct? Correct. And that's when they started asking you, did you see any other cars? Um, he, he specifically, he said, okay, you mentioned you saw some other cars. Do you remember anything specific about those cars? He didn't say, hey, you know, uh, did you see this other car or something? He didn't lead me in any kind of way. He just asked, hey, you stated earlier that you saw other cars. Is there anything specific you can remember? Like maybe the model, uh, color, make. And uh, you remember when all this happened back in 2007, in January 2007? Yeah. It was a big deal, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. A lot of media coverage, a lot of stuff going on. I tried not to, even to this day. I absolutely, with all due respect um, to the family, I absolutely have hated this experience. It's not something I want to remember. Uh, to collect my own sanity, I've, I've had to take three blood pressure pills instead of one. Um, I go home and hug my kids. As a result, it's been stressful, it hasn't been fun, and I don't like to hear anything about the details. If I could, imagine listening to the radio and you hear your name. Mr. Jenkins, uh, I, I, I do sympathize with you as far as I think everybody involved in this case has. Um, Just to answer your question, stuff. I don't watch anything about this trial. I got you. You don't watch anything about this trial. I don't watch anything about this trial. And that's purposely. Uh, and that's based on your experience coming into court and testifying and all the, the whole rigmarole with that. It's just to protect me. Yeah, but again, <laughs> it's since having to testify in Mr. Boyd's first trial, correct? That's whenever this is all heated up. Say that again. Since testifying the first time in mm -hmm. Mr. Boyd's federal trial, that's when things started getting heated up. And No, it was heated from day one. I mean, so are you telling this jury that you didn't watch any more media coverage at all after you were in the break room that day and you saw the forerunner? Sir, I don't know if I can make this as clear as I can. This is their job. I didn't ask for this. I don't want to see any part of it. I don't want to hear the details. Have I heard details from coworkers or people who swear they know everything about the trial? You know, there's always a coworker who comes up to you when they find out that you're in the trial and they want to say, yeah, I heard this, that, and the other. I've got coworkers who will share stuff on social media and whatnot, and, and I've actually unfriended them. And they're like, why are you unfriending me? Because I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. I'm trying to forget it and move past. Mr. Jenkins, my question was, since you saw no, that sir. initial, and I've asked, I've answered you twice. <laughs> no, sir. Well, I don't, I don't think you have. I understand that you don't want to uh, <laughs> watch the coverage or anything. But my question was, since seeing that initial report with the four one runner, are you saying that you haven't seen any media coverage back in 2007? You haven't watched any no, media coverage, sir. All right. So you're not aware of whether or not that white car with the red pinstripe was put out over the media along with Mr. Boyd's face. No, sir. Okay. You weren't exposed to any of that media footage? No, sir. And that wouldn't have any influence at all on your testimony today? No, sir. How close did this car, the uh, forerunner, get to you? Um, I would say I was probably sitting here and probably roughly the wall, the wall line here. Somewhere, I guess that's about what? 30 feet or so? Probably. Okay. Maybe give or take add about 10 feet to it. And that encounter took what about 20 seconds or so? Um, yeah, give or take, yeah. And because you were sitting there and 
parked over in the dark section across from the uh, from the waste connections. That caused you to call your dad. Actually, it was dark behind me, uh -huh. but I was parked in more Light. of a lighted area. Mm -hmm. I mean, common sense will tell you if you're the only one there to avoid the dark behind you, you're gonna park in more of a lighted area. So I parked closer toward the street edge. Gotcha. Where it's more lighted. Gotcha. And Mr. Uh, Jenkins, I know I, I think you've already said that this you don't want to have anything to do with this whole situation, but you uh, we did send our investigator out there to come talk to you, correct? Correct. Mr. Cohan, uh, several months that. ago, mm -hmm. and at that point in time, you refused to talk with my investigator, correct? Uh, yeah, and actually, he broke the law by coming on my property that had no trespassing, but I ignored that and let him introduce himself anyway. Well, he was courteous, but he was not. Well, no. He wasn't? I mean, clearly if I've got no trespassing sitting there on the, on the tree, everyone else knows they don't go past the tree line. He came on and got on my porch. Now, and when he came on to my porch, my daughter answered the door. So, no, I was pretty taken aback by that. How did you get my address? Why are you here? And again, he simply introduced himself to you, yeah. correct? And yeah, he was told him you didn't, And you told him you didn't want to talk to him? Correct. And at that point in time, he left, correct? Correct. He didn't harass you? No. He didn't give you a hard time? No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Just briefly, and to be clear, uh, sir, the previous times you have testified uh, in federal court? Correct. correct. And there's a transcript of that testimony? Yes. You testified in Mr. Uh, Cobbins' trial? I've testified in probably every one of them, yes. You testified in all the state trials and yes. the retrials, yes. and there are transcripts yes. as to what you said. Yes. That's all. The only thing, in most of the trials where you were cross-examined, there weren't a whole lot of, those attorneys, when they were asking you questions, were asking you questions related to their clients, correct? That is, Primarily. Yeah, that is correct. And actually, in one particular case, I remember uh, Takesha, uh, she actually told me she's not interested in talking about that particular, because it was dealing with someone else's trial, and I started to talk about the white vehicle, and she said, no, we're not interested in that right now. And again, they weren't asking you a whole bunch of questions about the white car. It's all having to do with the forerunner, right? Uh, Primarily. Yeah. All right. As opposed to my general story. solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. No. Please have a seat. Let's get up a little bit closer. Give us your name, please. Adrian Mathis. And uh, it's fair to say you're only here today because you have been personally served with the state. Yes. You have no desire to be here. Correct. Um, Mr. Boyd, is, are you related to Mr. Boyd? Yes. How are you related to Mr. Boyd? He's my cousin. Uh, directing your attention back to January 2007, did you have a vehicle? Uh, I believe so. What kind of vehicle was it? Uh, white sunburn. Uh, directing your attention to Exhibit 31. Do you recognize Exhibit 31? Um, yes. And what is Exhibit 31? Looks like my car, but I'm kind of not for sure. All right. Go exhibit 29. You recognize exhibit 29? Yes. And what is exhibit 29? Looks like the tail of my car. And uh, let's see. Uh, now, your, uh, your white uh, vehicle had, where were you living at at the time? Uh, town 
Yes, Your Honor. Now, did something happen maybe towards the end of the year concerning gas? No, the car was always messed up. Okay. And as a result of that, did you have to get a housing gas pop to you or something? No, I have gas cans in the back. Okay. And when the gas, where would the gas can be? Probably in the trunk. In the trunk. I understand this is difficult. Did you have occasion to loan your car to somebody the first weekend of January 2006? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Do you recall testifying in previous trials? No, I don't. Okay. Do you recall testifying specifically in George Thomas' trial? It looks like December 1, 2009. It started on December 1, 2009. And do you recall testifying in that trial? No, not really. Okay. If I can approach and let me show you this transcript. Do you recognize Adrian Mathis as being your name? Yes. Do you recall coming to court and testifying in previous occasions? I've been to court a lot. And prior to testifying, do you recall being sworn in? Yes. Are you from Detroit? Yes. Do you recall in George Thomas being asked the question, now, did you have a cousin or do you still have a cousin by the name of Eric Boyd? Yes. And you answering yes? Yes. Do you recall being asked the question, did you have a conversation with him the first weekend of January 2007? I don't recall it right now. Okay. So do you recall getting the answer, I believe so? Probably so. Do you recall being asked this question, as a result of the conversation, what did you then do? And given the answer, let him borrow my car. I guess so, if y'all got it in there. But you don't recall that? I do not remember that. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Page 358 on Thomas's. Let me ask you this. Do you recall testifying in the latest trial, Vanessa Coleman's trial in 2010? I do not. Do you not? Do you recall being asked, looks like, looks like we started the trial May 3rd, 2010. Again, and your name is Adrian Mathis? Yes. Is that correct? And you're from Detroit again? Yes. Do you recall being asked the question, the first weekend of January 2007, did you loan that white sunbird to somebody? Honestly, I couldn't really tell you. I loaned my car out to everybody. Sure. Do you recall giving the answer yes? If it's in there, I probably did. And do you recall being asked the question, and who was that? Not really. And do you recall giving that answer? And what is that answer? It says my cousin. Your cousin who? Eric Boyd. Your Honor, and again, I think just out of an abundance of caution, if we, I think we're going to try to proceed under Rule 613.26, and I think that in order to try to go that route, we're going to need a jury out hearing. Yes, the state would. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the matter has been brought up that I have to take up outside your presence. So please go with your court officer, and you can leave your notebooks there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And I think there is a hearsay rule that uh, the state could get in. It was asking the state if, uh, if she was trying to refresh the witness's recollection. Clearly, that wasn't uh, happening. And at that point in time, I guess you can also impeach with prior um, inconsistent statements as an impeachment tool. But I don't think we were quite doing what the rule would contemplate for that. So I was trying to make sure that we uh, follow the procedures that we need to, even for impeachment, or as a uh, rule um, 803.26, which would be uh, them coming in. So I'm just trying to make sure that we follow the procedures that we're supposed to follow for the admission of these type of statements. And, and the state did give me a forewarning that this may be what we're going to be dealing with. Please, Your Honor, the state, uh, we're going to seek to introduce um, the transcripts of her testimony on uh, this issue and a, a second issue that I'm going to ask her about under 803.26. And 803.26 provides a prior inconsistent statement of a testifying witness, a statement otherwise admissible under uh, Rule 613B if all of the following uh, conditions are satisfied. A, the declarant must testify at the trial or hearing and be subject to cross-examination concerning the statement. B, the statement must be an audio or video recorded statement, a written statement signed by the witness, or a statement given under oath. I believe that's what we have here, six prior transcripts. Uh, and C, the judge must conduct a hearing outside the presence of the jury to determine by a preponderance of the evidence that the prior statement was made under circumstances indicating trustworthiness. And I think that by her testifying that she does not recall, um, you know, loaning the car to anybody or who she loaned the car to, uh, we believe that that is, um, uh, establishes a surprise and consistent statement. It's a prior inconsistent statement. Ms. Mathis, these previous times that you've testified, were you testifying truthfully or were you simply repeating a statement that somebody had wanted you to say or come into court and testify to? I was just repeating what I've seen. Huh? Just repeating what I've seen on paper. Repeating what you'd seen on paper? Yes. Okay. Where had you seen it on paper? Uh, I guess previous statements 
from the rest of the trials, I believe so. Okay. Those circumstances where you were shown paper, was that where you were simply, they, in preparation to call you as a witness, you were shown previous statements and just said, refer to this, or, or look, re references, review this? Uh, yeah, I said, that's prior to my testimony. Okay. Um, were you being truthful in those previous trials? Being truthful, your... I can't remember anything from when that happened, to be honest with you. So you don't know whether you were being truthful or not? Probably not if I'm reading it off the paper. Reading it off the paper. Um, were you being truthful at the federal grand jury? It was already on the paper. I just memorized it and went with it. Are you talking about the your uh, copy of your notes from where the detectives came out and interviewed you? Mm. Were you given a transcript of your of an interview from when a detective came and talked to you? Well, they pretty much prepped me. Before. When you say they prepped you, are you talking about the the AUSA? Uh, I have no clue who it was. Which trial are we talking about? Uh, Eric Joyce. Okay. We're talking about the first in, in time, the trial back in 2007. <coughs> so that would have been the federal trial? Yes. Okay, so you're saying that you were being prepped to testify falsely? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm not for sure. I just pretty much went with it. You went, went along with what they were saying. Yes. So your testimony from the federal trial, that is not truthful? Uh, probably not. Okay. You wish to ask another question? Uh, please. Um, just so the judge knows, it's fair to say, do you recall uh, talking to the, before you testified in the grand jury or court, do you recall test, uh, talking to law enforcement? Do you uh, recall talking to Investigator Childress? Well, I talked to somebody before him too, though. Okay, you, you recall talking to somebody uh, before Investigator Childress, but you recall talking to Investigator Childress? I believe so. And you recall giving him consent to search your car? That piece of paper? Yeah. That piece of paper? Yeah, that piece of paper, I'm not for sure because they said it was searched in town view, but the car was never in town view. No, right, no, no, the location where he came, he came to you in town view. Yeah, but the car was never in town view. Right. But I, what I'm saying is that, do you recall talking to Investigator Childress on this date here? Looks like January 16th, 2007. Not really. Okay, is that your signature? That's my signature. Okay. Now, do you recall uh, testifying, I, I guess, talking to federal officers, and you recall testifying in the grand jury? Vaguely. Okay. And then do you recall testifying at Mr. Boyd's federal trial? Vaguely. And do you recall when you testified at Mr. Boyd's federal trial, explaining to the court then that you had received pressure from the family <coughs> to change your story? Not that I'm aware of. Did you, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, do you recall, um, where, where did you have to go to? Did Mr. Boyd contact you on a Sunday and tell you that the car was broke down in front of his mom's house? Mm, not that I can remember. Do you recall going to Ridgebrook getting the car? No, I never picked the car back up. Right, but do you recall going to Ridgebrook and seeing the car? Yes. Okay. When you got to Ridge, where was the car at in Ridgebrook? Uh, parked in front of my aunt's house. And who's your aunt? Uh, Nancy Boyd. And does she have a son? Yes. Who is her son? Eric Boyd. And so the car was parked in front of his, does he live there? At the time, I'm not sure. I don't know. And so when you went to uh, Ridgewood where the car was, did you look in the car for a CD? Can't really recall. Do you recall looking in the car? Tell you the truth, not for sure. Do you recall whether or not you found anything in the car? And so this is the second thing I wanted to ask you about, and that's gonna be, you recall previously testifying, all of the previous hearing trials, uh, to finding a sandwich bag of bullets. Don't recall, I may have. Okay. A clear sandwich bag of bullets. You just don't recall saying that? Yeah. You don't recall testifying to that? Right. You're not saying that that's not true, it's just you don't recall sitting here today? Well, I just don't remember. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, As you sit here today, you don't recall whether or not you did that or not. Right. 
as you sit here today, you don't recall whether or not you loaned your car to Mr. Boyd or not. Right. It could have been anybody. Including mm -hmm. Mr. Boyd. Right. You just don't recall as you sit here. Right. And so um, you do, of course, recall testifying. Before you testified in federal court, you were under oath. Right. And you swore to tell the truth. Yes. Uh, looks like uh, when you testified here in state court, I've got Vanessa Coleman, I think you testified twice in her case. Before you testified, you recall being sworn in. I could have. And, of course, you would have told the truth. Say so, yes. Yeah. It looks like uh, Mr. Thomas, you testified twice in his case. And before you testified, of course, you would have been sworn in. This every time, I think. Every time. And you would have told the truth. And Mr. Coppin's case, that was a little different because you recall that the defense attorney actually called you as a witness. I don't you, you don't. You don't recall who we are. But if, before you testified in Mr. Coppin's case, you recall you were sworn in. I guess so. And swore to tell, to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And so of all of those transcripts uh, provide that you, and I understand that as you sit here today, you don't recall, but if in all of those transcripts, you testified under oath that you loaned your card to Mr. Boyd the first week of uh, first weekend or first week of January 2007. As you sit here today, you don't recall whether or not you did that or not. Right. And uh, if all of these transcripts show that when you got, the, he called you to tell you that the car wasn't working, you go and get the car on Monday and you find a, a bag of itty bitty bullets. Um, as you sit here today, you just don't recall that. Correct. But if the transcripts say it, that's what you testified to. I guess so. All right. Um, under these circumstances, <coughs> you can ask for about for inconsistent statements. I, I, I know you have done some questioning about it. The tenor of her responses has been she's not denying that she made those statements. She's simply saying she can't remember. Since she's not denying, Extrinsic evidence is not admissible. The, the extrinsic evidence can only come in to be evident if she flat out denies making the statement. When she simply says she doesn't remember, and in her case, she repeatedly said, well, if it's in there, I must have said it. Okay. Under those circumstances, I, I cannot admit the, the uh, transcripts as extrinsic evidence. So Even under 803.6? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So it's a right. Yes. But I, again, you can't ask her about, did you make this statement? Okay. I think, I think you've done that, but under these circumstances, if you want to reinforce what you've done, and then allow Mr. Frazier to cross-examine, I'll allow you to do that. Yes, sir. Anything further we need to take up at this time? No, sir. Before I do, uh, as you sit here today, do you recall whether or not you loaned your uh, white card to Mr. Boyd the first weekend of January 2007? 
You have to say anything. I do not recall. Okay. Now, do you recall whether or not you got a phone call from Mr. Boyd? Do you recall getting a phone call from Mr. Boyd on Sunday concerning your uh, your white pine yak? No, I do not recall. Uh, do you recall um, at some point in time going to get your car? No, I do not recall. Oh, that, right. Did you go to Ridgebrook to get your car? Uh, not to go get my car. I'm sorry, I apologize. Did you have uh, have an occasion to go to Ridgebrook to see your car? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us about that? I can't remember. Okay. Um, in Ridgebrook, who lives in Ridgebrook? My aunt. And what is her, your aunt's name? Nancy Boyd. And Nancy Boyd, does Nancy Boyd have a son? Yes. And who is her son? Eric Boyd. Is Eric Boyd, Boyd your cousin? Yes. Is Eric Boyd seated at the defense table? Yes. Today, what is Mr. Boyd held on? Uh, a suit. Okay. The registry reflects the witness identified the defendant. Did, did you know whether or not uh, Mr. Boyd lived in Ridgebrook with his mom, Nancy? I can't recall. Okay. And so whenever you went to Ridgebrook to see your car, um, did you look for anything in your car? I can't recall. Sure. Okay. And so I, I saw when I talk about those two things, whether or not who you whether or not you loaned your car to somebody and whether or not you looked in your car for anything. It's okay. So, of course, you recall testifying previously at previous proceedings. Yes. And so first I want to start with uh, the federal transcript and I'm going to start on page 90. I can't tell you the volume, I just printed it out. Uh, are we going to use them as extrinsic evidence or are you just going to ask her if she recalls testifying? Yeah, I was going to, well, I was going to show her the lines. I'm, I'm not seeking to introduce them, but I was going to show her the lines. I was thinking that you could ask her whether she made the statement or whether she could recall. Uh, but, yeah. In a previous court setting, <coughs> question being asked to you and drawing your attention back to the weekend of January 6, 2000, I'm sorry, January 6 through January 8, 2007, were you in your car and did you have control of your car or did somebody else borrow it? And you recall giving an answer on what date? I could have, I just don't remember. Okay. Uh, do you recall being asked, you're going to have to tell me I'm just trying to draw your attention back to the general weekend which is the weekend roughly of January 6th through January 8th January 6th would be a Friday and you recall giving the answer yes somebody brought it I don't recall 
you don't recall that. Do you recall being asked the question, okay, who borrowed your car? You do not no. recall that question? No. Do you recall giving the answer, Eric Boyd? No. no? And do you recall being asked the question, your cousin, and you saying yes? No. Do you recall being asked the question, the defendant in the courtroom? No. And you give the answer, yes? Okay. And do you recall being asked the question, do you remember what day he borrowed the car, and your answer being either Thursday or Friday? Can't recall. Can't recall, okay. Now, do you recall, I'm on page 100, I don't know. Do you recall being asked uh, the question in a court, previous court proceeding, okay, and did you go inside to try and get the keys or what did you do? I no. Do you recall giving the answer, I went inside to get the keys? I don't recall. Now, so whenever you told us before that you, were, that you went to Ridgebrook and you saw your car, did you have the keys with you or did you have to go get the keys? I really don't remember. Okay, that's fair. Do you, do you, re okay. do you recall um, being asked the question, did you see Eric Boyd? I don't remember, but if it's in there, I guess. Okay, and you saying yes. So you're not denying this, you're just saying as you sit here today, you don't recall what happened January 2007. Correct. Uh, do you recall being asked the question, did he say anything to you? And your answer being yes, he said my car was broke down. But it was always broke down, so if it's in there. Okay. And uh, do you recall uh, asking, you being asked what did you do, and you saying I went out there and tried to start my car up? Um, let me jump ahead. Did you have to ride the bus over to um, Ridgebrook? I really can't recall. You can't recall? That's, that's true. Um, let's see here. Let me jump over. And do you recall being asked? So you were trying to get your belongings out, meaning your car, and you saying yes? And you being asked, and did you find some of your CDs? You saying yes. And then the question being, do you recall, recall being asked this, did you find anything else in the car? And do you recall answering yes, a sandwich bag of bullets? Do you recall no, no. giving that answer? No. Uh, uh, question being a clear sandwich bag, and you saying yes, a uh, bullets. And do you recall giving a description of the bullets? No. Saying about like your um, finger? The length of your pinky finger? I can't recall. Can't recall that? Okay. You're not saying it didn't happen, you're just saying you don't recall. I just don't remember anything. Even okay. After it happened, probably. Right. All right, let's go to um, court. A court proceeding in 2010, do you recall being sworn in and being asked the question um, in May 2010 that the first weekend in January 2007, did you loan that white sunbird to somebody? Do you recall being asked that question in 2010? I don't recall. Do you recall being uh, given the answer yes? I don't recall. Do you recall being asked the question and who was that? Don't recall, and recall giving the answer, my cousin Eric Boyd. Don't recall. Do you recall being asked the question, okay, did you look in the car, did you find anything in the car? I don't recall. And do you recall giving the answer, yes, some bullets? I don't recall. Okay. And do you recall being asked, can you describe those bullets? And you give the answer, they were small bullets. And do you recall being asked the question, and were they loose bullets or were they in something? And you given the answer, they was in a sandwich bag. I don't recall. Do you recall, okay. do you recall a, a court proceeding in 2009? 
being asked a question as a result of the conversation, what did you do then? And well, let me back up. Let me back up. You go. You recall being asked, now, did you have a cousin or do you still have a cousin by the name of Eric Boyd? You saying yes, which you recall that, that is true. I was about to say you could ask. <laughs> uh, do you recall being asked the question, did you have a conversation with him the first weekend of January 2007? And you give him the answer, I believe so. I don't recall. I don't recall. And you recall being asked the question, as a result of the conversation, what did you then do? And you give him the answer, let him borrow my car. Um, do you recall being asked the question, tell us what, if anything, you found in the car and you given the answer, small bullets on the passenger side seat? I don't recall. You recall being asked the question, do you know approximately how many bullets you found and given the answer, no, it was in a sandwich bag? I don't recall. You recall being asked the question, a sandwich bag, and you given the answer, yes, probably I'd say more than 10. Do you recall um, testifying at another proceeding in 2009? <coughs> Again, concerning the car. Um, and who was it you loaned it to? And you given the answer, my cousin Eric. I don't recall. You don't recall that? And do you recall being asked the question, and did he have it the entirety of that weekend? And you given the answer, I believe so. I don't recall. Don't recall. Okay. And do you recall uh, being asked the question, do you recall finding anything inside of your car when you got back into it after that weekend? And you given the answer, yeah, a sandwich bag full of bullets. I don't recall. Not that it didn't happen, you just don't recall it as you sit here today. Don't let me ring you. Almost finished. 2012 in a court proceeding, you recall being asked, do you know Eric Boyd? And you give him the answer, yes. You recall testifying to that? I really don't recall. Sure. And being asked, and who is Eric Boyd? You're saying my cousin. You recall <coughs> down here uh, being asked the question, and did you have anything, did you keep any, oh, I'm sorry. You recall being asked back in January 2000, January of 2007, did you ever loan your vehicle to anybody? You answering yes, do you recall that? Do you recall being asked the question, who did you loan it to? And your answer being, my cousin, Eric Boyd. I don't recall. Do you recall uh, being asked the question, okay, did you notice anything inside of the vehicle? Your answer being, yeah. I don't recall. Do you recall being asked the question, what did you notice inside of the vehicle? Your answer being bullets. You recall being asked the question, and what kind of bullets, and your answer being small bullets? I don't recall. You recall being asked, asked the question, and where were the bullets at, and your answer being on the passenger side floorboard? I don't recall. And do you recall being asked the question, and what, were they loose, or were they in anything, and you given the answer, they was in a sandwich bag? I don't recall. Okay. Here's the last one. Do you recall testifying in 2013? And uh, being asked about Mr. Boyd, do you recall being asked the question, and did you have occasion to loan him your vehicle the first weekend of January 2007? And your answer being yes. I don't recall. Uh, do you recall, uh, after you being asked the question, okay, after you loaned it to him, do you recall being in the vehicle? You give the answer, yeah and being asked the question after you loaned it to him, yeah, and being asked the question, I guess, tell us about that, and you given the answer, he called me and told me my car was broke down. I went over to Ridgebrook, where my aunt lived, and that's Miss Boyd, right, Nancy? Yes. And to see what was wrong with it, and he was like, it was overheating and everything. Is that what would happen to your car? Where it would cut off. Okay. And I looked in the car to get some of my stuff out of there, and then I found a sandwich bag of bullets. And do you recall giving that answer? I don't recall. Do you recall being asked the question, and can you describe the bullets? And you give the answer, they were small. I don't recall. 
you recall being asked the question, okay, when you say small, about how small, and you uh, indicating about pinky size. Do you recall that? For, and just for the record, can you hold up your little pinky so we can see? And for the record, you're indicating your pinky. And do you recall uh, being asked this question now in Exhibit 14? Can you tell us where you found that sandwich bag of bullets? And you give the answer on the passenger side underneath the seat. Oh, okay. And it's not that that didn't happen. You're just saying, as you sit here today, you don't recall. If I could show you Exhibit 424, uh, do you recognize, um, you of course recall Investigator Todd Childress yes. uh, with the Knoxville Police Department? Yes. Do you recall talking to him? No, not really. No? Okay. Do you recognize your signature here? Yes. And uh, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what this is? Do you re probably don't recall signing this, I guess. Correct. Have you had a chance to read over it? Uh, no. No? Okay. Do you recognize this as being a Knoxville Police Department voluntary consent to search vehicle? Yes. Now, at the time, back in January 2007, you were living at 1100 Townview Towers? On and off, yes. Did you probably talk with Investigator Childress in the parking lot or in your apartment? I have no clue. No clue? Okay. And again, your name is Adrian Mathis? Yes. Uh, is your date of birth 11-1982? Yes. Um, and your vehicle, I think we got the tag number up there. I can't see that well, but is your tag number, can you look up there and see, is your tag number 320-CYS? Um, yeah, it's sitting right here. Sitting right there, sitting right there. So is that the same tag number? I have no clue. No, uh, the same tag oh, number? Oh, yes. The 320? On the picture, yes. Okay. All right. And that's your name? Yes. And that is your signature there? Yes. And you are the registered owner of that vehicle? Yes. I'd like to move Exhibit 424 in as evidence. <coughs> Never searched in town view. Right. You don't recall uh, the incident happen, happening in January 2007? Correct. What you recall is, for whatever reason, you went to Ridgebrook and you saw your car there? Correct. You don't know how it got there? No, I can't really remember. That's, that's fair. And when we went through the previous testimony, you, you're just saying you don't recall testifying? Correct. You don't recall what you said? Correct. Not that it didn't happen, it's just you don't recall. Correct. Ms. Mathis, I'm sure you won't recall this either, but you testified at a uh, proceeding on January 18th, 2007 before the federal grand jury. Do you recall that? I do not. I can approach you. Do you recall when being asked questions about loaning your car to uh, your cousin, Mr. Boyd, being asked the question, did he borrow it on a Sunday the 7th? And your, do you recall your answer being it's a possibility it was Sunday the 7th? Because the next day he was telling me the same day he was telling me something went, was wrong with my car. Do you recall <coughs> that statement? I don't recall. Uh, do you recall being asked the question, um, was it the complete question is okay what would be accurate in terms of time or day 
and when. Do you need a reference to the page, General Fitzgerald? Yes. No, okay. Uh, okay. Would it, what would be accurate in terms of what time of day, and then think about the day? Answer: It was probably around. It was the afternoon when he borrowed my call. Do you, my car. Do you remember making that statement? I don't recall. You don't recall. And um, do you recall being asked the question? Um, Did you, do you recall the question about um, in reference to when he borrowed the car, your answer being because I went to see my aunt on Sunday and asked her if she was going to church, and he asked me if he could go pick up a friend in my car. Do you recall giving that answer? I don't recall. And do you recall being asked the question, was it the same day? And your answer, I'm sorry, the question was he borrowed the car and then returned it on the same day, and your answer to that question was yes. Do you recall that statement? I do not recall. You don't recall. <coughs> Ms. Mathis, prior to you coming into court here today, uh, my investigator has been trying to get in touch with you, is that correct? Probably so. And you have not responded to his inquiries or his attempts to contact you in regards to court today responded to nobody You've responded to nobody I think that's clear thank you Ms. Mathis and just so it is clear we tried to contact you um, you would not respond back to us either. correct right again it is uh, I, you do not want to be here correct has anyone in your family contacted you no now I see you called for the proceeding First of all, after the grand jury proceedings, and you had to testify in, in federal court. Uh, and they were asking about your, do you remember being asked about your grand jury testimony in federal court? No. no. And um, being asked the question, okay, why would you have told the law, the police officer, that, Ms. Mathis? And given the answer, I don't know, I was feeling pressured. Do you recall giving that answer? Yeah. Do you recall being asked the question, why were you feeling pressured? and given the answer because my family kept telling me I didn't remember what day that he bought the car. Do you recall giving that answer? <laughs> that sounds about right, but I don't recall that answer. Yes, ma'am. Do you recall being asked the question, who in your family was telling you this? And given the answer, my aunt and my brother. I don't recall. Now your aunt, is that Miss Boyd, is that Mr. Boyd's mom? Yes. And your brother, is that Kevin Armstrong? Yes. Well, I should have just read the next question. Do you recall, uh, and could you name those people, please, and give them the answer, Nancy Boyd and Kevin Armstrong? Do you recall being asked the question, and now what were they telling you, and given the answer that I didn't remember what day I let him borrow the car? I don't recall. And as you sit here today, you don't recall what day you let him, well, you don't recall who borrowed the car? Correct. I showed them to her. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I moved them in, but I was sitting with them in now. They were coming later on with the police officer. Mm -hmm.
29, my memory is that she was able to identify, identify 29. I thought she was good to be sure the license was there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please have a seat. Give the jury your name, please, sir. My name is Jerome Arnold. Live here in Knoxville, Mr. Arnold? I used to. I no longer live here. I live in the Chattanooga area now, but in 2007, I was living in Knoxville. That's my next question. Where did you live in 2007? I was living at 2124 Chipman Street in Northeast Knoxville. And specifically January 2007, were you living there? I was living there in January 2000. And if you don't care to uh, look to this map to your right, see if you can spot on this map where your house was. Yes. And you may actually have a call out there for that address. Oh, it actually, yeah, that's it right there. Okay, and then you've got a call out to 2124 Chipman Street. Yes. Kind of a black house from on Bora Street? Yes. Uh, I can return to Now, on in the uh, late evening hours of uh, January 6th on into January 7th, uh, January 7th, uh, Saturday night, uh, during that first weekend in uh, January, were you home? I was. Uh, in the early morning hours, were you awake? I was awake. I was watching television. You have to recall what you were watching? Yes, I was watching a program called The Outer Limits. Uh, and uh, you recall while watching that program hearing something? I did. Um, I heard three pops in the distance off to my, I was sitting with in a chair with my back to the window on Chipman. And I heard a sound, three pops, to my left. And uh, when it happened, I, you know, I was watching a late night television program. I looked at my watch and it was 1.45. Um, you know, at, at first I thought, well, it was a week after New Year's, maybe somebody's shooting off some leftover firecrackers or something, but it stopped with those three pops. And do you remember the approximate sequence and timing between each of those pops? It was pop? it was fairly short. It was like pop, pop, pop. Was there any delay to any extent between the shots? None that I could tell. And just so we're clear, when you told us you were watching TV, your back was to Chitlin Street. It was. And the sound came from your left and to the rear? Yes. And if you don't care to, I mean, one more time, step down and look at this map 
Okay, I was, I was sitting in the house with my back to the street. The sound came from this direction off up toward this white town with the waste on there. It was a big plug company. You don't care, I'll pick the blue marker. You can just maybe draw a line that approximates the distance or the area from where you got the sound came. You didn't think too much of it at the time? No, not at the time. And then, of course, later on, uh, contacted by law enforcement. They gave an interview about what you had heard at that hour. Yes. And have testified in several other trials involved in this matter. I have. Absolutely. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine, thank you. You've testified in several different proceedings. You've been asked some various questions. From where you are, where your house is situated, I mean, you're, you're aware of 2316 Chipman Street where the murders took place. I am. Okay. And from where your house is, you have a fairly good view of that location, do you not? Yes. Okay. And I don't think the distance, even though they're sitting apart in the place, they're, they're not too far from each other. Would you agree? They were almost exactly one block apart because there's no 2200 block on Chipman Street. Gotcha. It goes from the 2100 block, no 2200, it goes directly to 2300. And I know that there have been previous times where there may have been people arguing or fighting or fussing in the street and that you would be, in those circumstances, if they were in the road, you have heard that, correct? I would have heard something like that. Yeah. And on the night, other than the three pops, you didn't hear any, any noises, any screaming or anything like that? I did not. And I'm not going to ask you any questions about insulation, um, about the various houses involved. Um, and I believe you said the direction the sounds came from, and I don't think you testified to it today with uh, General Morton, but previous testimony, it came from the southeast over towards the, the train tracks. I think you've testified to that multiple times. Northeast. Correct? Northeast, that's what I said. The northeast, towards the trail. The train toward the train tracks. Okay. And this was at 145, and you said that you were watching the other I was one. watching television, and I heard the pops, and you know, I was already knew that it was late, so I looked at my watch when I heard the pops, and it was 1.45. Now, the, the uh, thank you, Mr. Arnold. Anything else? No, Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Please have a seat, sir. <coughs> give the jury your name, please, sir. Roy Thurman. Thurman, how old are you, please? I'm 61. And you do not live in Knox County anymore, is that correct? That's correct. Back in 2007, January 2007, where did you live? I lived in Rockwood, but I worked in Knoxville. Where did you work in Knoxville? At r and t Coding. Where is that located? I forget. I think it's Boone Street, if I'm not mistaken. And tell us the type of work you did. I was a sandblaster. What all involved in 
I've sandblasted all different kinds of stuff to be powder coated. Now, in uh, January of 2007, did there come a time where you went to work early one morning and you saw something? Yes, sir. And uh, do you recall what day it was? It was on a Sunday. And uh, what time did you get to work that day? I arrived about 7.45 a.m. And when you arrived, how long was it before you noticed something? Uh, approximately about five, ten minutes. So you just had gotten to work? Yes, sir. Now, I'll ask you if what you saw was some smoke. Yes, sir. And where was it coming from? Uh, from off of the railroad tracks behind my sandblasting room. And about how close is your sandblasting area to the railroad track? Mm, probably about 25 to feet, 15 feet, somewhere around in there. And the, uh, was it a lot of smoke, a little bit of smoke? There wasn't a whole lot of smoke. I want to show you some pictures, see if you recognize these pictures. First, there are three of them. They're going to be exhibits 16, 17, and 18. Do you recognize each of these pictures? Yes. Okay, look, now I'm going to put them right there on that screen and also up on the wall. Right <coughs> Is that uh, exhibit 16 that you've identified just a minute ago? Yes, that's my sandblasting area. Is that where you were working? Yes. Is that looking out toward the railroad track? That's looking okay. toward the side the railroad tracks are in behind the... And, and just so we're clear, in January, the foliage would not be on these trees. Is that right? That's shown in these pictures? Right. So these pictures were taken sometime later when the leaves were out? Yes. And Exhibit 17, what does that show us? Where the railroad tracks are in behind the trees. Is that from the vantage point where you would have been to see the smoke that you told us about? Yes. Looking out from yes. your area? Yes, sir. And lastly, Exhibit 18, what are we looking at there? And that's the where we powder coated. Yeah, okay. Is that the open area that where you were working? Yes. Looking. I was working right in this area where the green is. And if you know, where was this picture taken from? When it was taken, where where was the person taking the picture? Where were they standing approximately? Uh, back on this side of the fence. And there was an empty lot and then another building. And they were standing in between the buildings and our, and between, between that building and our building on that empty lot to take the picture. Is that near the railroad track? Yes. From where this picture was taken? Yes. We would move 16, 17, and 18 then. Where did you get to? No, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. you about the time of the year the leaves weren't on the trees so you had a pretty good view of where the smoke was coming up correct yes now um, is it unusual to see smoke coming from in that from over in that area near the railroad tracks not too often you never hardly seen any just every once in a while you'd see do, do people use that there through the uh, railroad track sometimes as a cut through as they're going to and from Cherry Street or some of the other places? Well, a lot of the people walked up and down the railroad tracks. Okay, so there are there is a fair amount of foot traffic up and yes. down the railroad tracks, okay. And so it was sort of unusual, but not anything that really stood out, is that correct? Right. No further questions. No, sir, I didn't get your name. Roy Thurman. Thank 
one of this. Uh -huh. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Absolutely. Please have a seat. Please give your name. J. D. Ford, F. O. R. D. Sir, uh, where are you employed? I'm an employee of Norfolk Southern Corporation. How long have you been employed there? Since 1996. And what did you do there? Uh, I'm a locomotive engineer. <coughs> Sir, if I could raise your attention uh, back to January 2007. What calendar here? Direct your attention to Sunday, uh, January 7, 2007. You call whether or not you were working on that day? Yes, ma'am, I was. Can you call the time you went into work? Uh, it was 8.15, I believe it was that morning. And uh, <coughs> was there a particular route you were going to take that day on the train? Yeah, at that time I had a regular route between Knoxville and Chattanooga. So what time did you leave Knoxville? We departed the yard uh, sometime after 12 p.m. afternoon. So, I don't know, 12, 10, 12, 05, somewhere in the neighborhood. What time would you have arrived in Chattanooga? Uh, well, it's about a four hour run if you don't have other trains to meet. It's single track with side tracks along the way. And uh, so it's about a four hour run, but you know, every time you get to meet a train, it's another 45 minutes or so, so. Tell us what happened. Well, that morning after we left the yard, uh, came across Cherry Street, after we got everything out of the yard that we were moving that day, and uh, I noticed, I don't know, probably about as far as I could see, 50 or 75 yards, I guess you'd say, uh, something that first, glance I thought was maybe a piece of burnt wood but it had the appearance of a body and the closer I got as we were proceeding up toward it I could definitely tell it was a body and then as I got right over it I could see the less burned parts from the thighs down that it was definitely a body but well in my opinion at that time I thought it was a body what did you do? Uh, well, my conductor was preoccupied. He was talking to the dispatcher. So I set out in the cab. Uh, I said, hey, that looks like a body. You know, and I was kind of going back and forth with just myself over, you know, what I was thinking that, you know, it could have been, as I said. And, uh, so he really wasn't paying attention. So as I got over the top of it, where I could look outside the window, uh, well, with it, with it closed, I could just you know, see what I could see. Uh, I stopped the train and I told him, you know, I got his attention, his undivided <laughs> attention, you know, by the, the emotional outburst I had, you know, like, dude, that's a body. Uh, so then I contacted the chief dispatcher and told him, he's like the, he's the boss of the dispatchers that control our train movements. And, uh, he said, well, just stay right there. And I was like, all right. So I wanted to be sure it was a body, you know, that somebody didn't pull some kind of weird practical joke, you know, doing something like that. So I asked the conductor if he wanted to go back there, and, you know, he didn't. He said, no, I'm just going to stay right here. So I decided that I was going to take the voyage back to make sure it, you know, was what I thought it was. Yes, I did. What did you see? I saw a severely burned uh, man uh, that would, didn't have any clothing on. And, uh, After observing that, uh, what did y'all do? I contacted the chief again before I, you know, after I gathered myself, you know, because it was quite an emotional experience. Uh, not something I'd ever witnessed before. 
uh, and then I called him, told him, yes, it definitely was. And uh, he told me that, just, you know, to go back to the engine, that the authorities would be there in the next few minutes. And so I did. The time I got back down to the, I believe that's 9th Avenue. By the time I got back there, there was a, the police were arriving. We've got a couple of uh, photographs. Let me first ask you, um, directing your attention to Exhibit 427, do you recognize Exhibit 427? Top of here. Recognize this aerial shot? Yeah. Now, um, if, if I could, can you explain to the jury what is a sign with a W? What does that mean? Now, that's a whistleboard. Uh, there's two different kinds. Down south, they have a kind that's a Morse code letter Q. It's an old, it comes from an English thing. I mean, we're coming through with a Queen's phrase. And I guess they just had, you know, more signs. Uh, a whole bunch of signs. Anyway, they all, those cues ended up down south. You don't see any of those up north. Uh, and there's a, uh, most of them are the letter W, which means whistle. And it's about 2,500 feet before you come to a crossing. Well, they, they figure it out, though, you know, with your speed, about 15 seconds before you get there. Now, showing you on exhibit 427, did you see who you saw the body? Approximately. Yeah, it's about, I don't know if it's, it's behind this warehouse. I'm not getting confused exactly. You know, not, we're not, <laughs> I've got some uh, pictures. But it's, it's right in this area. Okay. Right, it's just past the whistle board for this crossing. Okay, and so what we, let's look at some pictures and we'll look for the whistle. Directing your attention to Exhibit 19. Do you recognize, I know you're probably not used to this view either, but do you recognize what's shown here in Exhibit 19? Yes, ma'am, yeah. What is shown here in Exhibit 19? That's a warehouse, and down there about, you can see, at least on this, you okay. can see the whistle board whistle. right in here. Exhibit 20? Yeah, that's, that's a little closer picture of, this, of the same. Do you see that, uh, the W right there? Probably. Oh yeah, there, there it is, yeah. Yeah, there's a W. And uh, now that W, direct, keeping your attention on the W, and you, for the record, I'm getting ready to show you the picture of, of the body. Uh, exhibit 21, is this what you saw? Yes, ma'am. Exhibit 22, do you recognize Exhibit 22? Yes, ma'am. And what is Exhibit 22? Well, that's when they took and put his body in that bag and put him on that device to, you know, load him up when and Fred Duff is truck. Like Exhibit 19, 19, 20, 21, 22, is that this? No, that's right. So that's indeed who she is. And so now looking back, of those pictures looking back, um, do you see on this aerial map approximately where you saw the body? Yes, ma'am. So it's going to be over here in this, you know, this area. Okay. Can you use a use that red marker just for the next one? Sorry. Sure.
safety and running freight on the uh, railroad traffic, <clears throat> there's a record of the various railroad cars that are moving, correct, on the tracks? I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm just saying that, that the companies keep record of which trains are operating on the lines, correct? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. It was Maybe didn't ask you the question. But, yeah, the uh, trains that are on the lines, the, the companies keep track of what time they depart, what time they arrive, correct? Yes, sir. And um, I know that you've previously looked at at least your departure and arrival for your the train you were on that day, correct? Not in a while, but yes, I have. Looked. Not in a while, but, but you have previously reviewed it. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to prompt, trip you up, okay? Um, so, again, you were going down to Chattanooga, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And you left the yard here in Knoxville to go down to Chattanooga, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And um, you weren't the only freight train operating on those lines that day? No, sir. No further questions. I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, approximately what time do you think it was that you uh, stopped the train? It was around 12.20. And uh, when you stopped the train, uh, it, were you blocking Cherry Street? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anything else? You can step down and answer. Thank you.
That's 466 Southwest 3rd, four, I'm sorry, 466 South with Southwest 3rd, 49. And that's going to be the case that we're relying upon in asking that um, Ms. Um, Mathis's testimony, for instance, she said she didn't recall uh, that that be deemed inconsistent and just the portions that we uh, ask her about to be uh, admitted into evidence under 803.26. It is inconsistent, but under the other statute, it could be extrinsic evidence that no one was witnessed uh, unless the prior, prior, prior statement is denied. It is inconsistent, consistent with this theory. It also has to be denied, and if she doesn't deny it, she just says she feels <coughs> so I'll revisit that when you all want to. Let's just speak about your testimony. Yes, sir, I'm just saying we're, we're relying upon statement. Stay away from me. looking across the street. And so this is wider here and this is and that's Chittenden Street. Yes ma'am. Exhibit twenty eight? What are we looking at here? That's the stop sign in front of the house. That's where the car was parked. And is that the car we see in the <coughs> top? Yes ma'am. If you could take a look here, do you recognize a Chipman and Glider on this diagram? Yes. On this aerial view? Do you see on this aerial view where uh, your house is or house was? Right here. Can you use in that red marker? Can you use an X to mark where your house was? And uh, on this aerial map, do you see where the forerunner was from at 145 when the police knocked on your door? Mr. 
Ms. Feibel, when you saw this car parked in front of your house, uh, you didn't see any anybody around the vehicle up as far as, you didn't see the vehicle get dropped off is the point. No, sir. And so you certainly didn't see Eric Boyd there? No, sir. Or anybody else on no, the car? Sir. You were in your house sleeping? Yes, solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Please have a seat on Please give your name, sir. I am Keith DeBoe with the Knoxville Police Department. And what do you do with the Knoxville Police Department? I am a lieutenant. I am the executive officer for the West Patrol District and also the commander of the Special Operations Squad. How long have you been with the Knoxville Police Department? 24 years. Direct your attention back to January 2007. Uh, were you so employed? I was. Um, I want to direct uh, your attention to the investigation involving um, Shannon, Christian, and Chris Newsom. Were you involved in uh, preparing for a, preparing 2316 Shipman Street for a search warrant? I was. Explain to us uh, that process. Uh, I wasn't intimately involved in the process so much. Uh, myself and another Officer, uh, Officer Josh Schaefer, we're at a, an advanced school for, for SWAT. Um, I believe it was Lieutenant Jeff Stiles called us about a block away from there and said we had, uh, our criminal investigative division had secured a search warrant for that re particular residence. That the uh, detectives were going to attempt to do a, a knock and talk there, trying to, going to try to gain compliance uh, entry into the residence. And if, if nobody came to the door, uh, forced entry was needed. We would approach and uh, enter the, the residence itself. Now, um, is that because you're a member of SWAT? Yes. And uh, so, what was the, uh, I guess, the plan in entering the residence? What's your plan when you enter the residence prepared for a search? Uh, depending on the layout of the house, and of course, this one unfolded, we didn't have a lot of information going into it, but basically, as safely as possible clearing through the residence. Our job as the tactical unit of the SWAT team is to basically make a safe working environment for everybody. So we secure the scene looking for either victims of the crime or suspects involved in the, uh, the activity. So we basically secure a residence, secure an area, and, uh, and just provide a safe working environment so that the detectives and the folks in the criminal investigative division can come back and, uh, and do their business. Uh, is that what you did for 2316 We did. Uh, if you could share with the uh, jury what you did on January 9, 2007. Um, once a, a couple of the detectives had gone on and attempted to make contact and uh, they were unsuccessful. They called us up, motioned us up. We moved up. I was the first one walking into the residence, um, walked into a closed off um, area, front porch and there was a blanket over the doorway. I pulled it away. We announced the police search warrant, um, entered through and into the, the living room, and just uh, we flowed through and kept clearing. I moved through the living area into a side bedroom and then uh, continued through into the bathroom area until the whole house was secured. And directing your attention to the diagram, do you recognize uh, that diagram to be a layout of the house? I do. If you don't mind, if you could show uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the passage you took in front of the house. Absolutely. If you look here from the area, um, as we move through, here's this little enclosed front porch. You come through, and this is the entrance to the house. Um, the blanket was here, pulled it away, walked in. 
into this living room, this little entryway back into this bedroom here. So we went through, I can't remember who came in, but we came, I came this way, of course, and we're going through people are flowing. The whole team's just kind of working together, flowing. But I come through here, into the bedroom, and then into this little bathroom area, and then step into this bedroom. And then by that time, everybody's calling clear, 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 clear. And then I call for a back clear, which is we had one area, I believe it was in this area, um, that was a ceiling. It was unsecured. So there's an area that we hadn't cleared yet, but everything else was clear. So, Aaron, if you want to continue to keep going. Sure. So, as I call for this black back clear and look into the kitchen, um, I noticed in the corner of a trash uh, or a trash can that was oddly out of shape. Uh, Lieutenant Fortin was in here. We work together, so we see each other. But now, of course, the trash can. Lieutenant Fortin sees me and looks at the trash can. He he knows what I'm thinking. I know what he's thinking. He brings his weapon up to bear. I bring my weapon up to bear, and uh, I advance on the trash can. I pop that trash can open. And and that's how we got to that point. Were you able to determine whether or not uh, she, she was dead? Yes, ma'am. There was no signs of life in the victim. She was, she was apparently deceased. I propose we show you exhibits uh, 34, 35, and 36. Do you recognize exhibits 34, 35, and 36? I do. And what do you recognize them to be? The trash can I just mentioned, and then uh, the victim's body in the trash can right there. That's exhibit 34, 35, and 36 in the evidence. Oh, yes, Your Honor. That can be received. Exhibit 34, what are we looking at here? The trash can itself. 35? The same with the victim in it. And 36? The same. Now, once. Uh, found the victim and determined she was deceased, what did you then do? I uh, immediately notified Lieutenant, uh, let me see, it may have been Sergeant Todd Snarley. He was over the, uh, the investigation, pretty much he was the supervisor over it. Okay. We still uh, had business to conduct, so we kind of turned that over to them. And then uh, I, I don't know if Lieutenant Stiles and I then left, but we went to get some equipment, come back. We still had the attic. I think we had some outside areas we still had to secure as well. So. We just uh, kept doing our business. Um, on January 11, 2007, did you have uh, the occasion to assist in uh, the apprehension of Mr. Davis? I did. If you could, tell us about that, please. Um, again, this is a couple of days later, so Officer Schaefer and myself were still at the school, attending the school, and we got called back to that one. This time we were called back to over uh, at 220 Carrick Street where the police academy was. Lieutenant Doug Stiles at that time was there and said we had uh, had the suspect located and we were going to take him into custody. So what did you then do? I made a plan for chemical agent deployment. So the discussions were back and forth, how and how, why and what. And my specific job was to come up with a uh, chemical agent deployment plan, which I, I did loaded gas weapons and everything else. The general plan was we were going to drive up in our armored vehicle, our hot zone vehicle, and uh, surround the house, call the suspect out, hopefully gain compliance that way, or deploy chemical agents and try to force them out of the house. Explain to us what happened. So as we approached the house and got out uh, and did the call out, the suspect came to a window on the west side of the house and placed his hands on the windows and I guess surrendered from, from a window inside the house. We approached uh, after a couple of questions. Um, I broke the window out of the house and we pulled the suspect out of the house and had taken him into custody. And what did you then do? Uh, loaded back up and went back to my school and finished the school out. If I can direct your attention to uh, the wall, you recognize exhibit 268? I do. And what is Exhibit 268? It is the house the suspect was in. Exhibit 269? The same. 
like to move exhibit 268 and 269 into judgment. That was the market statement that was taken in the second? Yes, ma'am, it was. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so your involvement in this investigation had to do with you being on the uh, SWAT team, is that correct? To assist yes, sir. Detectives Special Operations Squad, but yes, SWAT team. Okay. And I know when you said you made entry into the home, uh, was the door secure? Um, no. Okay. It was unlocked? I believe it was unlocked. We did not use any type of breaching device. I'm trying to think. I know the blanket was over the door, and I believe it was just unlocked when we opened okay. it. And when you were talking, uh, again, I, I, I certainly am following what you're saying. When you made entry and everybody's flowing, you're talking about the unit as a whole that's proceeding into the home. Is that correct? Yes. And as you're proceeding, <coughs> some of the team members are branching off to make sure that your sides and your flanks are secure, that there's not going to be any sort of threat or anybody yes. in one of the other rooms. So you have people team members branching off and securing different locations as the main team is moving forward. Is that correct? It, it wasn't a very big residence, so it's, it's about 800, 900 feet, something yes. like that. Okay. So it didn't take you long to flow through the building. And when you were telling the jury that you turned and you saw the, the um, trash can sort of oddly shaped or oddly looking and drew your attention and you looked at your partner and he knew what you were thinking, when you saw that, you had a concern that perhaps there could be someone concealed there, is that correct? Yes, sir. Not that there was a body in there? Yes, sir. And you were trying to make sure that there's not a threat or some other, somebody with a gun or something like that. And then I guess you made sure that the rest of that location was secure, weren't any suspects at that location, correct? Yes, sir. Right. And so then, Later on, you were contacted again because you're with the SWAT team, or what did you say, the special? Special operations. Special team. operations team. Um, was because at that point in time, you had at least, or did somebody with the law enforcement had determined the location that Mr. Uh, Davidson, LaMarcus Davidson, where he was at, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that would have been one of the detectives are you, you were just contacting and say, hey, dude, th this suspect is in this location, get him. Is that kind of yes. that, summarizing it? Out of my purview. <laughs> there were other officers who were handling the investigation. Yes, sir. You were contacted to apprehend him, correct? Yes, sir. And so there was discussion about using chemical agents? Yes, sir. And so you're not aware of the circumstances as to how law enforcement learned that LaMarcus Davidson was holed up in that house? No, sir. Okay. So you wouldn't have been aware whether or not it was Mr. Boyd that assisted and told law enforcement where he was hiding? No, sir. And I think you said that you got to the scene and there was at least, uh, gave him an opportunity to come out peacefully. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And he chose that he came out? He came out. Solemnly swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Please have a seat. 
Gerald Smith. Are you currently employed or are you retired? I'm retired, sir. Yeah, tell the jury a little bit about your uh, employment in law enforcement arena. Uh, yes, sir. My background is in the field of forensics, uh, actually forensic science to begin with, and then I ended up getting into the crime scene processing, crime scene detail. So I actually ended up, once I finally retired, uh, 45 years in the field of forensics. Okay. And uh, actually, on the time period of this case, I was with the Knoxville Police Department. Prior to that, you were employed by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation? Yes, sir, that's correct. I was with the state for 27 years, uh, mainly in the forensics or in the crime laboratory. Uh, actually in Nashville for two, Chattanooga for five, and then I was the regional supervisor here in Knoxville. Back in, in 2007, specifically January 2007, say so you were employed by the Knoxville Police Department? Yes, sir. Crime uh, scene specialist? Uh, yes, sir, the actual title, <laughs> the payroll title would have been senior evidence technician, uh, but I worked in the forensic unit in the crime scene detail. I worked totally in the field, processing scenes, uh, collecting evidence, and uh, working with the needs of both the officers and the investigators. Tell the jury what it uh, is you did at that time in, in terms of processing the scene. Uh, I oftentimes use the word processing. Uh, a lot of times uh, the types of scenes I would go to could be anywhere between a, a vandalism to a burglary and then all the way up to a homicide type case. But uh, when you say processing, that includes a lot of things. Uh, identifying what's going on there, and your goal is to try to end up painting a picture so that uh, can help the investigator determine indeed what has happened in that scene. Uh, do a lot of photography, uh, fingerprint processing at a scene. Sometimes other special things like special lights or special chemicals. But the goal is always just to collect the evidence, identify it, uh, secure it, make sure it's protected, and then collect the evidence, and then uh, whether it be through just photography or actually collecting items of physical evidence. Uh, directing your attention, first of all, to uh, a scene at 1800 Reynolds Street on January 11th. Do you recall going to that location, being asked to go to that location? Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, in the afternoon of, of that day, which was actually a Thursday, I'd, uh, I'd been on my days off during uh, some of the other activity that was going on in this case. But as I came in to work on that day, uh, shortly before four o'clock, heard the radio call come out for forensics to come to that location, and I responded. And when you responded, what's the first thing you did? Uh, actually, the first thing I did, and, and I always try to do this, is find out who's in, who is there and who is in charge of the scene and, uh, and what has happened prior to me getting there. Try to discuss with them uh, exactly uh, some of the things that they are looking for me to do while I'm there. But uh, initially, go up, observe the scene, talk to the lead people who are there, and, uh, and then begin processing and collecting the evidence. And did you get a, an idea of what had gone on prior to arriving and what, what they wanted them to do? Yes, sir. I, uh, upon arrival, I was informed that the Special Operations Squad had actually taken into custody uh, LaMarcus or Americus Davison there at that scene. Uh, I could observe the window that had been broken out that uh, Mr. Davison had been taken out of the house through that window. It, it was my understanding. Uh, initially, also, they gave me a couple of items of clothing that he had that they had taken off of him. So I, I immediately had to collect those and secure those. But then I began on the house. And beginning on the house would involve what? Uh, first of all, taking a series of pictures, try to identify. Uh, when you look at items at a scene or at a house, you're mainly to, trying to determine what may or may not have some type of evidentiary value. Uh, maybe some way you're going to be able to link the suspect back to 
the original crime scene through the collecting. So I mainly just identified what was there, take pictures of what was there, and then begin that collection. So the first thing would be to take pictures of, the, of items in place where they are, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. That's the normal procedure uh, to, to show up with a camera around the neck and, and begin that first. Okay. And then collect anything that may have any value. Yes, sir, that's correct. If I could uh, show you a series of photographs that you took that day, tell us what we're looking at. Exhibit 268, I believe that's already been entered into evidence. Uh, that would be the uh, coming up from the driveway. There was a slide hill going up to this house at 1800 Reynolds. Uh, I had gotten to 1800 Reynolds just off of Western Avenue. And uh, as I arrived there and I walked up, uh, that's the first thing I observed. And I also observed uh, that disturbance or activity had occurred in that northwest room of the house, which is uh, was kind of the front living room, I guess you could say. And that window on the side had been broken out. Talking about this window right here? Yes, sir, that's correct. And that uh, sign, the realty sign, was it uh, associated there, with that house? Yes, sir, that it was. There was a realty sign in the front yard. Next picture. Uh, this is a picture from inside, and actually, uh, through this picture, you can observe uh, many of the items that I collected. Do I have a pointer to, sir? I don't know. Is, is this? center of the room, this folding metal chair uh, sitting right in the center of the room. I had a black hoodie zipper sweatshirt. Uh, here on the floor was a cell phone. Uh, here on the floor also was a, uh, a Pasco set binoculars. Over in the corner there was a gray sweatshirt and then there was a pair of black and silver shoes behind me that, that can be seen here. Uh, that is uh, Captain Holliday was on the scene. Uh, he was the captain in the Criminal Investigation Division and the other person in the window is Sergeant Snodderly who was also with the Criminal Investigation Division. Okay. Next picture. Just a better close-up showing the cell phone, the black hoodie, Again, you can see a better picture of the shoes over in the corner in the gray sweatshirt, uh, just showing them up closer. And that will be exhibit 271, I believe you introduced it. Exhibit 272. Uh, 272 was a Verizon Motorola cell phone, and in 2007, we would have said that was a flip phone, I believe is okay. what we would have called it. All right. And Obviously, some broken glass around it. Yes, sir. This is just below the window that had been broken out to for the special operations squad. 273. Uh, this is actually just a cell phone charger. That's actually the front wall and the, the front window of that northwest uh, corner room. That's the same room as, as the other items that you it's told about. Same room, but it wasn't shown in that overall picture. That's the front wall. Okay. That's exhibit 273, exhibit 274. Uh, that's the, uh, the brand name was Tasco, a small set of uh, binoculars that was there on the floor in that room. 275. Uh, 275 was that black hooded zipper sweatshirt and uh, there were actually several items inside that front pocket that, that uh, I took out and collected at that time. Do you recall uh, what those items were in, in the pocket? Or? Yes, sir, there were actually several. One was a, a set of lip gloss type stuff or lip smack or two. There was a goodies pen, a broken nail clipper, a rolled up $1 bill, uh, some torn pieces of paper with 
numbers and names on them. Uh, there were two or three of those, a couple of nickels, and uh, the most significantly, I guess there was a, a nine-shot, 22-caliber revolver in that pocket. That, that was a 275, 276. Yes, sir. This is where I've taken the uh, the revolver out of that pocket and. Uh, to start to look at it and uh, check on whether or not it was loaded and identify. This was a uh, Sentinel high standard revolver. Was it loaded? Nine shot. Uh, no, sir, it was empty. Did you find any bullets that would be associated with it? No, sir, there were no uh, cartridges found at the scene. Okay. That'd be exhibit 276, 277. Yes, sir, that's just a close-up showing the brand name. It was the Sentinel. The actual model number was R103, and the serial number of that revolver was 154018H3. Okay. 279. Uh, this is where uh, we, we have opened up the revolver and just indicating that it was empty. There are no cartridges in that cylinder. It is a nine shot, 22 caliber cylinder weapon. And again, if, if, if shot, it would not eject any spent casings, is that correct? That's correct. It was a revolver and if shot, the cartridge cases would remain in that cylinder. 280. Uh, over in the corner of the room, there was this gray sweatshirt, and I actually ended up later on removing the sweatshirt and showing uh, these Nike uh, black and gray tennis shoes that I recovered from there. There was also a great uh, soda bottle uh, food club or food city brand, and it was empty also. 281. Uh, that photo, I've just uh, removed the, the gray sweatshirt showing you the, uh, the Nike shoes and the gray soda bottle. That's all the pictures. Now these items that were of interest to you, what did you do about collecting those? Uh, each, each of those items was uh, collected. I would have marked them and identified the time I collected them where I found them and things like that, and then put, uh, sealed them, and eventually, uh, as I finished my duty that day, I would have placed them in the KPD property unit. And would they remain sealed, those items you see, uh, confiscated and sealed, would they remain sealed until they were forwarded for further examination by somebody else? Yes, sir, they would have remained sealed. Uh, and then at some point the lead investigator and the lead forensics person in the case would identify what needed to go on for further processing. I did some individual processing myself prior to sealing, like dusting for fingerprints and things like that. Now which items would you dust for fingerprints prior to sealing? Um, I actually dusted for fingerprints the nine or the revolver. Uh, I dusted for fingerprints, the cell phone, and the great bottle. And I'm at approach with what's been marked as exhibit 330. It's actually been open today, but I'll ask if you recognize this box. Mm -hmm. Sir, can I make one correction? I said I dusted for fingerprints on those items. Actually, I used a technique known as super glue fuming uh, to check fingerprints on the, uh, the bar. Sure.
this is actually that uh, the, the left shoe of that pair of shoes that was over there in the corner there, Nike Shocks. If I recall right, the uh, size was nine and a half. I would point out also that uh, when I seal something, I would put our case number on it, the date and time I collected it, my initials, and uh, where I, I collected it on that day. So the same would be on both shoes. Uh, why do you put the shoes in a can? Uh, I made the determination based on some of the information I had that a volatile accelerant had been used on or during the homicide of Mr. Newsom. And if, if that is the case, and possibly these shoes were at the scene, you need to seal that volatile accelerant inside a metal can so at some point in time it can be analyzed. Did you help me put the lid back on since you got gloves on? Yes, sir. Again, this uh, information that's written on the packaging material, this is a, what we would call a gun box. So if we collected a, a weapon at the scene, we normally put it in a box like this. Again, that same information, date, time, my initials, just so I, at some point in time I'll be able to identify it again. And can you unseal that if it's not unsealed? Show us what's in there. back at some point in time. Just so you can put it's safe, the cylinder's empty. Uh, yes, sir, again, this is that uh, that revolver that I collected at the scene, uh, the model number is R103 and the serial number is 1540183 as imprinted on the side of the revolver. And you say you uh, super glued, glued that to try to get fingerprints off of it? Yes, sir, that's correct. That's the, uh, you can kind of see a light cast to certain areas. It's a super glue fume comes up. Uh, if, that, if there's oil from a fingerprint, a latent that has touched it, then you'll be able to see that in that light cast. Were you able to uh, see any identifiable fingerprints or usable latent prints off that? No, sir, no usable latents were obtained on this revolver. Okay, so we return that. I would note one other additional thing that w was done is uh, the revolver handle was swabbed for what we would hope for and maybe forward to the lab for DNA analysis. Another item is marked exhibit number 391. Ask you to recognize that. Again, I can recognize this uh, by the information that I placed on it. And this is should be inside here the binoculars. Okay. Take care to unseal that and show us what the binoculars look like.
They are the Tasco small set of binoculars that were on the floor there at 1800. Also, if you had occasion to uh, process and collect items from a, a white client. Yes, sir, I did. You, uh, you know the place where you did that? Uh, yes, sir, I actually did that uh, processing on the 16th of January, which would have been the, the chief, uh, chief day of the second week. And tell us, uh, tell us about your examination that you uh, the examination was done out at the uh, city impound lot. Uh, the vehicle had been towed there from 2224 Ridgebrook and at the impound lot on the night of the sixth, uh, 16th, I went and processed it. Some of the same activity of photographing it, uh, looking for items of evidence, collecting them, then uh, selling them up just like we did at Brown Street. And uh, similar to that, did you take photos as you processed this vehicle? Yes, sir, I did. Exhibit 29, I believe, has already been introduced, perhaps. Uh, this was actually at night. I began somewhere around 7.30 in the evening, and it was dark that evening at the impound lot. And, uh, I did that, or wanted it to be dark for some of the things that I did to that car or with that car. And uh, first thing I would have taken pictures of the car from all four angles. Okay, this is a. That would have been the rear of the car, uh, tag number 320, uh, Charlie Yankee Sierra. Okay. Exhibit next, 14. Uh, photo from the uh, driver's side. Exhibit 14 is already in the uh, uh, This was a white uh, Pontiac Sunbird LE and it had some red trim on it. Exhibit 15? Uh, the front of the vehicle. And exhibit 31. Uh, that would be the passenger side, and you can see it printed there on the passenger side, and that would have been impound personnel marking that vehicle with an impound number and the date uh, that it was towed in from Ridgebrook to the city impound lot. It, does that picture depict any damage to the window? Th there was a broken out uh, rear the quarter window, as you can see there been covered with tape, but I made no determination about how long that would have been. Okay. Exhibit 32. Uh, just a couple of pictures inside, looking at the front uh, bucket seats there. Okay. 30, exhibit 33. Uh, the rear seat uh, showing that there was a white sweatshirt in the rear seat. And you can see some other items in the floorboard behind the driver's seat. Exhibit 47. Uh, close up of that white uh, sweatshirt that was in the back seat. Exhibit 55. Uh, this is behind the driver's door. Uh, obviously, there was a, uh, a can of antifreeze from O'Reilly's, as well as there was a white cotton glove up there. Exhibit 58. Uh, 58 is showing there were just numerous items and I actually ended up collecting a total of 36 items. But uh, this is under the driver's front seat. Uh, there were a lot of personal items belonging to uh, individuals like 
social security cards and things like that. Did you have to record the names of the individuals on those cards? Or? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, there was actually a whole bunch of personal identification that went to a family with the last name L-O-A-Y-O-N. Okay. on, and it, uh, there were social security cards that indicated to me there was probably a mother and her children's uh, information there. There was also a small purse in that area, coin purse. Uh, I'm back showing here the uh, passenger side front seat area. Uh, at the time I began processing and, and working with the lead investigator, Investigator Childress, uh, he had requested that I concentrate with the front passenger seat area. Okay. 61. Uh, under the front passenger seat or in that full board was the, the matching white cotton glove. So the two white gloves? Yes, sir. Okay. 66? Uh, 66, what I'm trying to show there is there was actually a palm ticket in the console of the front seats. And uh, that palm ticket actually was to uh, Adrian Mathis. Uh, 69 uh, is not a very good photograph. Uh, what I was attempting to show here, and I think maybe we can pick it up, and I was having trouble getting the camera and the flash and everything in the correct area, but right there is the butt of a, a sidekick holster, a gun holster. Yeah, you can see it much better there. That's the, uh, and this was actually way back underneath that passenger front seat, and it was a, a weapon holster, a gun holster. You say that the front passenger seat that was under? Yes, sir. 79? Uh, the trunk of the car, uh, in the trunk of the car, again, were some uh, uh, antifreeze type containers as well as there was a uh, Wetco 1.25 gallon uh, gasoline container. Jim Davis. Uh, closer up of that gasoline container showing the nozzle, and the nozzle did not have its cap on it. It was open. You recall if there was any gasoline in that? A very, very small amount of gasoline was in it, just enough that when I did a little slush to it, I could tell that you know, I could hear that there was enough in there and I actually uh, then had to empty it prior to putting it in our, our property room. Okay. Now the items that you found in the car that were of interest, did you confiscate those as you described earlier on? Processing the other thing? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to throw it in the mark exhibit 436. This is a box with the bag in it. Again, there's that information just for my identification so I know what it is. And my initials where I sealed it when I had it. Let's see what's in that. I would note that this, of course, is going to be the gasoline can, and I did make myself a note that I emptied, me, emptied the gas out of it. The gas can, again, I marked it for evidence. From the trunk? Yes, sir. W 
Who's that number? Four thirty-six. Yeah, four thirty-six. Move that into it. Any objections? Is marked Exhibit 429. Uh, it states Exhibit 429 would have been that boss sweatshirt. Okay. Can we have a look at that, please? markings on there that would be markings you did not place there is that correct that's correct that wouldn't again was this an item that was sealed up and uh, maintained in property room for later examination possibly yes sir. and i can i can actually see that uh, at some point this has gone on as there is a, a marking indication that that so it's got a TBI marking on it from the laboratory. Okay. Exhibit 429. Exhibit 435. Uh, also in the trunk and I'm not sure we saw a picture of it but there was a comforter bed comforter in the back of the trunk. I collected that. And all my records indicate it's multicolored. Uh, Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And envelopes labeled Exhibit 430. Again, this is the uh, holster uh, markings that we've talked about, and then there's also uh, the TBI markings from their laboratory here in Austin. It's a small uh, holster that's got Velcro clothes on it. Designed for a handgun? Yes, sir. A handgun, but beyond that, I wouldn't be able to 
to save revolver or we'll call it out. Who's moving 437, 438, and 430? Who's the No objection. Maybe two of them, then. I think And I'll also ask you, uh, at some point, were you asked to take a beautiful swab for Mr. Boyd? Uh, yes, sir. I actually did that on the afternoon of the 11th, okay. uh, same day that I'd been on rentals. Uh, when I got back to the safety building there, uh, Mr. Boyd and Mr. Davidson were there at the safety building. And uh, at one point, that evening or early evening I took uh, buckle swabs from Mr. Boyd. And that was done in the, one of the interview rooms. And that's merely uh, swabbing the cheek uh, for a DNA standard. And that's just to forward on to the lab? To see yes, sir, that's correct. That would be... For their examination? Yeah, that would provide to them the uh, official standard that they would need. Yes, sir. In courtroom today. Yes, sir. There, let's see, sit next to Mr. Fraser. Yes, sir. And, and similar to the other items, once you take that, do you seal it up and maintain it in a sealed condition uh, prior to sending it on to the lab or, or, or other examination? Yes, sir. The Knoxville Police Department has an entire property unit. Uh, once I'm completed with it, if they are not open for the day, then we have sealed safe type areas where I seal it, and only they can open it. Afternoon. Afternoon, sir. How long have you been doing um, crime scene investigation, forensics? Uh, actually, it began with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Would have been the middle 90s. Uh, the laboratory expanded into a program at that time called uh, Violent Crime Response Team, based upon uh, the fact that we had identified that a lot of times coming into the laboratory, uh, the shall I say, the caliber of what we were receiving was not what we wanted. So in addition to more field training for the locals, uh, the TBI also identified the need to have their own violent crime response team. So uh, I did that uh, last few years out of the TBI and then for 13 and a half years at KPD. Oh, 
Okay, so you came from TPI to KPD. Yes, sir. And to work with their uh, violent crime response team. Yes, sir. Okay. And um, so in approaching, again, I think you've already covered this, but in approaching a crime scene, one of the things that you're doing is you're documenting it, everything as far as the scene, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Securing it to keep it free from contamination. Yes, sir. Uh, most of the time when I would arrive, the scene would already be secured mm -hmm. uh, from the standpoint of uh, any uh, suspect would not be on the scene or anything. So the scene would normally be secure. I would arrive and then uh, begin doing forensic processing. Gotcha. And you obviously, as part of your training, you're familiar with a number of different techniques as far as how to process crime scenes for, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And uh, matter of fact, my last few years at the Knoxville Police Department, I taught their in-service new recruit class in crime scene management processing, as well as uh, our yearly 40-hour uh, necessary training that all law enforcement people had. I would teach the uh, Criminal Investigation Division short classes on the same subject. So that they were at least familiar with the techniques that the crime scene uh, forensics guys could do as far as yes, in, sir. in assisting them in their investigation of crime. Yes, sir, and it was certainly an all, uh, every evolving forensics over those years. Uh, you know, new techniques, new procedures, DNA kept advancing, so there was always things that needed to be done uh, that maybe the officers had never seen us do before. And taking us back at this point, you know, DNA is admissible in court, but going back to the 90s, I guess there were a lot of challenges to the admissibility of DNA as far as its reliability. So I was there, sir, at the infancy of DNA uh, within the TBI laboratory. Uh, Unfortunately, like many things, the state of Tennessee, we did lag behind some of the other states in the country. Uh, but certainly, uh, the process has evolved. Uh, more, smaller and smaller samples are capable of doing it faster and faster and faster. So uh, it, uh, it took a while, but it certainly, I think it's the most accepted scientific forensic procedure today. Gotcha. And so, again, when you went to the uh, location where Mr. Davidson was uh, located, I guess the first thing that you did was photograph and to document the scene as far as its condition, is that correct? Yes, sir. And when you collected the items, of course, you're recording where you collected them, is that correct? Yes, sir. To make sure that all that's on there. Did you do any sort of a crime scene diagram or anything like that? Uh, no, sir, not at this scene. Okay. And again, uh, I think in your direct you had made a mention of going to that scene with the idea of perhaps going back to another crime scene or linking it back. Would you have assumed, said that this was sort of a secondary crime scene or a secondary location? Because again, uh, Yes, sir, certainly this, this was really, in a way, it wasn't a crime scene. It was a taken into custody of the suspect scene. Uh, but certainly you hope that items that would be in the possession of Mr. Davidson, that you immediately around him, if you could collect them and if there was any way to link them back to the original crime scene, that, that would be one of the goals that you would have. And that would have been the house at Chipman Street was the primary crime scene. Yes, sir. The, there were actually two, the, the house and the yeah. railroad sign. And at some point, uh, okay, on the 11th, you processed the house where Mr. Davidson was at. You collected those items and secured them, put them into the evidence lockers, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And then later on that day, you went to KPD correct? Yes, sir. And my client, Mr. Boyd, was there and you collected a buccal swab or a fugal swab? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's a collection of skin cells from inside the mouth which contains DNA. Yes, sir, that's correct. Right. And again, that was secured, correct? Yes, sir. And the idea was that that DNA sample collected from Mr. Boyd 
could later then be tested against evidence maybe found at some of the other crimes. Against all items that had been collected, not only by me, but by the people that worked the primary scenes. And so later on, the determination was made that we wanted to look at this, uh, this white car, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, it was actually done on the 16th. On the 16th. Uh, we had it. It was at the impound lot. It wasn't going anywhere, so it was a prior prioritize when we got to it. And I know that you said that you wanted to go and look at the car in the dark. Could you elaborate a little bit about why you wanted to go there and, and look at the car? Yes, sir. I did some. I did some processing that. Uh, the state did not introduce or we did, did not cover. I actually uh, collected uh, swabs from the passenger side door, passenger side door handle. I did some tape lifts off the floor on the passenger side, the seat on the passenger side. But most specifically what you're probably asking for is I used a chemical spray on the uh, inside of the car and for was, the determination of, of the possible blood. Okay, so you used a chemical spray to see if you could find the location of blood. Yes, sir. And why would you do that kind of processing in the dark? Uh, because it illuminesces. And if you're in daylight, you don't see the illuminescent response to the chemical. So you, it, you need total darkness or as best you can. That's part of the process. So that car was processed with the idea that there may be blood or other biologicals located in there? It's, it was processed just under normal procedures that I use. Uh, it was something that I felt like needed to be done based upon the history of the crimes. Based on the information that you The information that I had been provided from the about the crimes, yes. So there, at least there was a thought that there may be some biological evidence that could be found in the car. I think it was more just to make sure. Okay. So was it also processed looking for any sort of prints or anything like that as well? The, the car yes, car. yes, sir. I processed it for fingerprints. And I think that's when you referenced doing some lifts. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, sir. I did this actually using a powder. I processed that car, passenger side area. Uh, with a powder, a uh, fingerprint powder. What type of powder did you use? Uh, I use a magnetic powder, black, with a magnetic wand. Uh, did you lift some prints? Yes, sir. Did some latents? And were those secured? Yes, sir, they were. Uh, do you know whether they were later sent off for testing? Uh, we would have done that in-house. Okay, so uh, that was done in-house? Uh, Technician Shade and Dan Crenshaw and our fingerprint unit were international certified late fingerprint examiners, and they would have looked at those. Uh, there were no matches made from the lifts I made. Okay. So there were no matches for either Shannon's or Christmas? No matches, period. Thank you. Did you discover any evidence of blood or anything in that car? No, sir. Everything that I did, and. Uh, I saw no observations of any fluorescent activity that would indicate it that to me. Thank you.